I want to continue to explore the topic of forgiveness. There's so much here to explore. Because we can look at what is forgiveness? What is the nature of it? What does it mean? And we can look at who is forgiven and for what. And we can look at who is doing the forgiving or not forgiving. So, for example, in a previous video, I dug into the fact that we think of forgiveness as holding a grudge and then at some point setting that aside, letting that down. Or if it was, for example, say a loan and 2000 is still owed on the loan and you forgive the debt and you say, never mind, don't worry about it, just consider it paid. And the 2000 is therefore no longer owed. It would be like carrying around a backpack and that's the grudge, that's the the offense that you hold against someone and then you set that backpack down and you don't carry it anymore and so you've credited their account or stopped crediting their account with the debt that they have against you and that for God there is no debt against God that we owe him that he is therefore saying you know what let's just call the deal off and so that's an entirely different idea than religion presents of forgiveness because religion very much presents the idea that God holds some grudge against you and there's something that you need to do or believe or profess or confess or whatever it is lifestyle change it varies from one religion to another from one denomination to another but there's something that you must do and that you must accomplish in order to get God to agree to set aside that grudge that he's holding against you. And that's typically the idea that we carry with the idea of forgiveness. Even with this, many interpretations still allow you to say, okay, well, all is forgiven. So even if your starting point is that there's a grudge, you at least arrive at a point where all is forgiven. I had the forgiveness filter which says that your interpretation of the Bible must be harmonious with the fact that Jesus proclaimed forgiveness. So Jesus proclaimed forgiveness while enthroned on the cross. And that was to the joy, praise, and honor of the Father. And so whatever you think the Bible says, it's either wrong or you've misunderstood it. If it's not harmonious with the characterizing God as a person who proclaimed forgiveness at the cross. So that has to be your interpretation tool. That's the, that's the forgiveness filter that your scripture interpretation bows down and plants its face in the dirt to Jesus proclaiming forgiveness. You do not have a Jesus that climbs down off the cross and says, well, you know what? I guess I missed that part of representing the Father. You don't have in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily rewritten to in him is the good cop part of the of the Godhead bodily. You don't have the exact representation of the nature and character of God, but oh wait, not except for that was just that one facet of God. So everything bows down to forgiveness. And whatever your interpretation is, if it doesn't make sense in being harmonious with with forgiveness, then you need to just shelve that for a while until you can reconsider it. So anything religion is teaching you that's not harmonious with forgiveness is wrong. And that's the forgiveness filter. So then we looked at the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and discovered that it's not God doing the not forgiving and that what this is actually talking about is that when you give the power of the devil, or pa the power of God, rather, to the devil, and you assign the power of God to the devil, you exist in perpetual confusion until you are released from assigning the power of God to the devil. You are in perpetual confusion as to whether something is from God or whether it's trick a trick from the devil. So if you can think that healing comes from the devil then you have to question whether the healing that somebody received might be a trick in order to lead them astray. And if you receive some sort of comfort in your pain, you have to wonder whether that came from God or if that's the devil trying to trick you. Therefore, you're in an eternal crisis, eternal damnation. And so you're stuck not knowing forgiveness. But it goes deeper than that because forgiveness 
isn't merely setting aside of a grudge, and it's not God who's doing the not forgiving. So one thing to understand is that what forgiveness is, is it's actually probably, I, I thought about the word to best describe it, and what I came up with was emancipation. It's an emancipation from slavery. So when the Bible talks about forgiveness of sins, it means emancipation. It doesn't mean God deciding not to hold those things against you because love keeps no record of wrongs. That's not harmonious with a proclamation of forgiveness. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Therefore, there isn't a wrong for him to say, you know what, I'm going to set that aside and not count that against you because there's no record of it to begin with. So what is not, what is forgiven? There's not a wrong that is being forgiven. What there is is there is an emancipation from the slavery to sin to the sin consciousness, to the mindset of sin. And that means that you have an emancipation from the law. That is why the New Testament is a battle between the law and grace. And this is a battle between valuing people based on their ability to conform to rules versus valuing people as in the likeness and image of God. Inherently, intrinsically, all people being created equal, being of equal and infinite value that they can neither be added to nor subtracted from based on their ability to keep rules. So that's a revolutionary idea and quite offensive to very many people that say that there's only a partial doing away of the law rather than an absolute counter-revolution and overturning of it. And so the whole thing, I want to show how sin and the law are related to each other. So from a law perspective, from a religion perspective, sin is the transgression of the law. It's when there's a rule, and if you don't keep that rule, that's sin. So any failure to keep a rule, whether it's something that you're supposed to do and you don't do it, or it's something you're supposed to not do and you do it, Whenever you transgress that law and you don't keep it, that's sin. That's what religion tells you. Then that's why you have, depends on your denomination. Smoking might be a sin or it might be acceptable. Drinking might be a sin or it might be acceptable. Playing poker might be a sin or it might be acceptable. Why? Because it depends on whether your denomination incurs that rule or not. If it has that rule and you break that rule, then that's a sin. If your denomination has a rule that says you attend Bible study unless you're on your deathbed and you don't attend Bible study, then that's a sin. So it's entirely based around the existence of a rule to be violated. And when the rule is violated, that's a sin. The New Testament makes an argument in which the sin is the creation of this rule by which you're determining someone's value. And it's not necessarily that rules are bad, per se, but that when you are valuing a person's righteousness by their ability to keep that rule, if you are valuing a person as being righteous because they keep the rules or being unrighteous because they don't keep the rules, that's what the sin is. The sin is in, incurred by the creation of a law. And so specifically, they're dealing with the law of Moses in the New Testament, but it's still an overall mindset, it's an overall mentality, it's an overall philosophy of saying conformity to the rules equals righteousness, non-conformity to the rules equals unrighteousness, versus saying that your righteousness is given to you by God and nobody can take it away. And that's the grace message. Your righteousness is given to you by God and no one can take it away. So, religion generally teaches a God who is unwilling or incapable of forgiving and presents forgiveness as an injustice. We also have a perverted sense of justice. We have a, as our symbol of justice a blind woman holding a book of the law and a sword and a scale. And so, what we have is we have the law, we have a woman who only cares, her, her only value is whether that law has been violated. So she's blind to, ideally, to whoever is committing the transgression, but just that there's a transgression. There's a scale, 
And what we think justice is, is to return harm for harm in equal value. Let the punishment fit the crime. So we have on one side of the scale what was done wrong to somebody or what violation of the law was committed. And on the other side, the harm that is going to be returned to that person for that transgression. And they should balance out. You should not have too heavy-handed of a punishment, or you should not have too light-handed of a punishment. The amount of harm returned for that harm should equal the harm given. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It should balance out. You return harm for harm. That's what we think justice is. Jesus said not to recompense evil for evil. He said to pray for those who despitefully use you. So this is entirely contrary to our sense of justice, where we say if somebody does something wrong, it's justice for something wrong to be done to them. Even if we only think of that wrong as being paying a fine, or being segregated for a period of time, or being under oversight for a period of time. In some way, we want to take something away from that person, and we consider that to be justice. We return harm for harm, and we call that justice. Therefore, forgiveness is an injustice, because forgiveness says you do not return harm for that harm. And so we think that justice equals returning harm for harm, and forgiveness is an injustice. This is most horribly represented in what I call the satanic gospel, and this is a message from a very much mainstream preacher, and I wrote down what he said, so... This is word for word. I'm not going to identify specifically who this is, but it doesn't matter. He's mainstream. I don't want to make it about the person giving the message. I want to make it about the words that are given here. This is a truly disgusting, satanic message, and this is what this preacher calls the gospel. He starts out by saying that we've all broken God's law and that God hates that. So, now I'm going to record what he said word for word. He said, God is just. He cannot just forgive you. Well, there you go. Two sentences in, and he's already identified that forgiveness is an injustice. Since God is just, he cannot simply forgive. There could be no clearer message of saying that, that forgiveness is an injustice than that statement right there. Before he can forgive you, justice must be satisfied which means that harm must be returned for harm. He clarifies this, and the only way justice can be satisfied is through the death of the one who has broken God's law. You deserve to die, and so do I. This is his satanic message that he calls the gospel. God is incapable of forgiveness unless he kills somebody, which means that it's not even forgiveness, it's payback. This is what he is saying, that there is no such thing as forgiveness. That would be an injustice. What there is, is payback. He said, but God's son became a man, lived a perfect life that you could never live, and then went to a cross, and on that cross, he bore the sins of his people, and every bit of divine wrath and holy justice of God's punishment toward evil, every bit that should be poured out on you and me was poured out on God's son. Again, this is payback. This is not forgiveness. What he is presenting is by no means a message of forgiveness. He is presenting a message of payback. Even still, what he is presenting is a message where the balance is supposedly paid. He continues, God crushed his only begotten son, and his son submitted willingly to being crushed, that as a man someone might die in your place. This is presenting an idea of justice now that not only is payback, but it doesn't really matter who is paid back. You can do something wrong and someone else can pay the price for it. And that still counts as payback. Jesus Christ died, and he paid for every crime you've ever committed or will commit against God. Well, in that, if we were to take that at face value, that would mean that it's paid. If my debt is paid then it's paid. It's, it's no longer owed. There's no double jeopardy. If I, own, if I owe a loan and my father or a friend or some anonymous benefactor pays the balance of that loan, I don't owe it anymore. I don't need to do anything at all. My part is finished because somebody else took it for me. 
Okay, so if you understand this, there's nothing, I don't have a part. I don't have a part in this if somebody else paid for me. I don't have a role. My only role is nothing. So, if Jesus Christ died, he paid for every crime you've ever committed or will commit against God. He rose again from the dead, and it was God's sign and seal that his death was accepted as payment for your sin. So, this preacher is presenting a message that God hasn't forgiven anything. He executed vengeance. And he executed vengeance on the wrong person. But he considered it a done deal. It's paid. Justice has been served. Except that he still stops short of believing that justice has been served. Because now's your part. That you have to do something. And he says, Now Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You ask me, what must I do? Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Which means that he didn't actually accept that as full payment. He only accepted it as pending payment if you agree to it. That would be like somebody saying, I'm willing to pay the remainder of your loan and then you can own your car outright. And I say, mm, let me think about whether I want to let you do that or not. Except that the, pay, the payment is sitting there having been accepted. So it, it, there's, what's the, which way does it go? Is it paid or not? Is it an escrow? Is it hypothetically paid? Is it paid if I agree to it? Do I have to sign off on some paperwork that says, I'll agree to this? But the thing is, he already went on that cross. So it's already been paid. Is it an escrow? I don't know. But this is very much the idea that religion presents to you of a God who is incapable of forgiveness. No matter how you look at this situation, there is nothing forgiven. There is something that is repaid. There is there is a balance of harm being done for harm. So, by contrast, the cross and Jesus was the birth of a new creation. The corn of wheat was buried, and it rose on the third day as the firstborn of new creation. The word spoken to bring forth this new creation was love. Love was spoken and expressed by laying down his life willingly. So this was not retribution, this was not payback. He laid down his life willingly. We're going to take a look at some scripture now. And so we see in Jeremiah 33, starting at verse 7, what God actually thinks of forgiveness, because it's utterly different than the idea that it is uh, an injustice. Jeremiah 33, 7, And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and I will build them as at the first. That's restoration. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto them. So whenever you come to any fear and trembling verses, remember that it's for goodness and prosperity that you're fearing and trembling. So just throw that into that verse there when somebody tries to make you afraid that the fear and trembling is the result of goodness and prosperity. It's obviously not talking about shitting your pants with fear. So Jesus laid down his life willingly. And we see that he refused to speak in condemnation as well. And we see in Isaiah 53, 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers, dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And he laid down his life willingly. In John 10, 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And we see in verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. Verse 18, no man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. The point I'm making here is that not only did he not open his mouth in condemnation, he refused to agree that he was being murdered. This is very significant. He refused to agree that he was being murdered. He refused to agree that he was being transgressed. 
So this is the nature of God, that he refuses to acknowledge that you've done something wrong, even when you nail him to a cross and kill him. He says, well, you know, I'm just surrendering my life. I'm laying it down of myself. What does it matter anyway? I have the power to take it back up again. I am the God over life and over death, and nothing you do can change that I am who I am. So it doesn't matter. I'll just let you do it to show you what kind of person I am, which is that I don't exact revenge. And that's the next point. God did not take revenge. There is no retribution. So in John 21, Jesus, having resurrected, could have said payback time. Peter could have been crapping himself, thinking, man, last thing that happened was I was denying this guy. But instead, Jesus comes and he restores him. Instead of exacting retribution, he restores him. Three times he asks Simon of Jonas, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. You know, what he does, not only does he not exact revenge, he, he restores his relationship, but he also says, guess what? You're even still the leader. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He even preserved Peter's leadership. So, what Peter did could have been something where revenge was taken, but instead, restoration took place. He refused the ability to exact retribution because that is not the way God operates. Instead, he restored. He reconciled. So we see in Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. What Jesus proclaimed on the cross, Luke twenty three thirty four, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's the proclamation. Forgiveness is the proclamation of God. It is not an injustice against God. God is not incapable of forgiveness. God is forgiveness. He is forgiveness. And so the idea is that forgiveness is emancipation. And this was something that I discovered kind of just looking into the idea of forgiveness altogether as not being the idea of setting aside a grudge. And you see that there's a number of times where remission of sins or forgiveness of sins is mentioned. And what I discovered was that what's being talked about here is an idea that's really in essentially the emancipation of sins. And when you think of it that way, that it's not God saying, you know what, even though you screwed up, I'm going to overlook that, or I'm going to set that aside, or I'm, I'm just going to you know, not deal with that. What this is actually saying is to be emancipated from it, which means that you were enslaved to something, and now you're no longer enslaved to it. So he says in Matthew 26, 28, For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And if we think of that, as being the emancipation of sins, the emancipation from being enslaved to sin. So we go and we continue and we see the idea of being a slave or a servant to sin. Jesus says in John 8, 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Free from what? That's talking about emancipation. Emancipation from being the servant of sin. In Romans 5.20, um, yeah, it says, The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, the law produced the idea of the offense to begin with. This is, this is where religion muddies the water here, going into Romans. There's, the other thing is, okay, all of this stuff that's written is written by people that know how to do writing. For some reason, and I don't even understand this, religion gives you this idea like, it's deadpan. Take it right at face value. Don't Consider that the people who wrote this really sucked at writing, didn't know anything about persuasive writing, didn't know how to use hyperbole, didn't know how to mock the opposition, didn't know how to use diatribe, 
didn't employ the use of sarcasm, didn't use picturesque language. These people, I don't know, they, they just were absolutely poor at communication and didn't know how to relate to people, which is logical if you think that you've got this intolerant, humorless jerk in the sky who's inspiring the writing. Well, why wouldn't this be some kind of humorless, intolerant diatribe from the intolerant deity that you think that uh, inspired it? But it's not. It's just like any other writing that we have that is issued in order to present a position, to argue in favor of a position, it uses sarcasm, it uses metaphor, it uses picturesque language, it it presents two sides, it mocks one of those sides. The Book of Romans has a ton of which is mockery. It's sarcasm. And this deadpan reading of this, as well as stuff Jesus said, this is this has got to go, man. This has got to go. This deadpan reading is killing your ability to understand the Bible. It's absolutely undermining any ability you can have. The reason for why things look like they contradict each other is because they do. And the way, reason they do is because one argument is putting another argument down. Because there, there's two sides being presented in an, in an argument in order to persuade you that one side is stupid and the other side makes sense. It's just the same thing that we have in any kind of satire and any kind of persuasive writing. That's what exists here in, in the Bible. That The Bible is not devoid of communication skills. That's why people come to it and think, you know... I don't understand what this says. It's because they're being taught wrong. They're not being taught to read it as like, wait, this sounds silly. Well, that's because the the writer is actually trying to make you understand that it is silly. That's why it sounds silly. So Paul starts in Romans 5. He says in 5.20, The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And then it says, as sin has reigned to death, even so grace might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The book of Romans is just littered with ridicule. And so we go to we get we get into chapter six, and it's saying that the law and sin are related to one another. And he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, already he's asking a stupid question. Okay, and it just irritates me to no end to watch people actually take this topic seriously when legalists ask this question, because the way Paul dealt with it was to basically respond by going, wow, that's a really stupid question. (laughs) And he continues to mock it. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Why? Why? Because he said that as sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Oh, so should we treat this like it's a mathematical equation? More sin, more grace, more sin, more grace, more sin. Well, that's ridiculous. So he says, God forbid. How should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? (sighs) Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead to the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. There you go. There's being a servant of sin. There's being enslaved to sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And there's the message. Forgiveness of sin is emancipation from being a slave to it. And what is the cause of this? It's related to law. So we'll continue to go into that. How sin is related to law. Romans 3.20 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. There you go. The law produces the knowledge of sin. Now, this should kind of ring some bells in your head. 
knowledge. Some kind of knowledge we're not supposed to have. A tree of knowledge of something good and evil. A tree of knowledge of good and sin. Okay? The law is that tree. Religion is that tree. That's what it's getting at. Okay? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and unto and upon all them that believe. So, one thing to understand is... Man, this... This verse just irritates me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, this goes back. This, this whole section here is preceded by saying, you know, well, what's the benefit of being a Jew? And he, Oh, yeah, man, it's great, man. You got the oracles of God, you know, the one that says you all suck as human beings. You know, I mean, you're vastly superior to everybody else. The Gentiles, the Gentiles hate you. you. You do nothing to represent God. Yeah, so um, his ultimate conclusion, we get down here, is that where is boasting then? It's excluded. So what was the benefit of being a Jew? There wasn't one, even though he initially says, oh, in every way. Because what did he do? He mocked it, okay? He, he made a point. What does the law say? The law says you suck. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what he's getting at. So... You know, what was the benefit of being a Jew? There wasn't one. That's his conclusion. If you read the deadpan, you see what's the benefit of being a Jew? Oh, tons of stuff. You know, you got the oracles of God. You know, you're God's chosen people. Isn't that awesome? But that's the deadpan reading. That's the wrong reading. He He's mocking it. He's ultimately concluding that there wasn't any benefit. There wasn't anything there. So now we go to Romans 4. It says... The law works wrath, for where no law is, there's no transgression. So if you don't have a law, okay, sin is the transgression of the law, but if there's no law, there's no transgression. See how the, the progression here works? Okay, so if I say no cake on Tuesday, you could conceivably eat cake on Tuesday, and then you'd be a sinner. But if I take away the law that says, don't eat cake on Tuesday, and eating cake on Tuesday is okay, then there's no sin anymore where cake on Tuesday is a problem. Because where there's no law, there's no transgression. You can't violate the rule of not eating cake on Tuesday if there's no rule that says don't eat cake on Tuesday. So, if sin is the transgression of the law, and you take away the law, you take away the transgression of the law, what have you taken away? Sin. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Because you can't sit, you know, you ate cake on Tuesday, and I can be upset about that, but if there's no law saying you can't eat cake on Tuesday, then that's my problem. Because you haven't done anything wrong. There's no law that says you can't eat cake on Tuesday, unless there's a law that says you can't eat cake on Tuesday. So now we get to the worst part that is most horribly misrepresented in Romans, which is Romans 7. And this is characterized as though Paul is just at wit's end of how much of a struggle it is to be a good boy. Oh, I really want to be a good boy, but boy, oh boy, my animal instincts, my Adamic nature, it just... I can't do the things I'm supposed to do. Oh, oh, it's just terrible. It's it's just awful. I really want to do the thing that's right, but I just can't help myself. Sin's in my body, and and I just can't help it. I end up doing the things that I don't want to do. That's how religion presents this. He's actually being ridiculous. Okay, the reason the whole thing, oh, the thing I try to do, I don't do, is because he's making ridicule of the law. Now here's the thing. He uses the illustration of a woman being married and, you know, being remarried and that if her husband's dead, she's free from that law in verse 3. And so it takes that illustration of a woman freed from the bonds of her marriage and applies it to the law of Moses. And it says, 
Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that's Christ, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, now flesh does not mean hedonism, okay? It doesn't mean drunken sex orgies. Flesh is the law. When we were in the law, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now, there are multiple meanings because it, it's, it's a two-edged sword. Okay, just like spirit means breath and spirit means wind. And you have born again is also born from above. All this double language thing. Adam means man. It also means earth. So when God made man in his likeness and image, God made Adam in his likeness and image, you can't separate these facts that these play on words go together. So when you think about things like flesh is related to the law, but it's also related to the fact that they cut off a piece of flesh and call that righteousness, right? circumcision. There's a piece of flesh that is supposed to be cut away and that's what, what causes you to be righteousness. Also, it's works that you do in your own flesh. You do works of the flesh by following a law. You conform to the law. So it's not saying that flesh, in the, like as the Gnostic idea, like that which is earthly and your, your skin suit that you walk around in is somehow uh, intrinsically sinful. It's talking about doing works of the flesh, keeping laws, cutting away cutting away body parts and saying that that's righteous. Do in order to produce your value. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. Okay, it says again, now we are delivered from the law, that being dead. Okay, so... Christ died, we died. That law no longer applies to us. Why? Because the law doesn't apply to the dead. Okay? So that law doesn't apply to us. Wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of letter. Okay? We should serve by the spirit. Okay? By inspiration. What is inspiration? It's God breathed into you. It's when God gives you that word and you know that that's what brings peace, that's what brings kindness, that's what brings love, that's what brings self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what comes from God. And so you serve by what you receive from within yourself, that is Emmanuel, the Holy Spirit within you, the mind of Christ that is, that is in you, the renewing of the mind. This is all not something coming from outside um, in inwardly it's not an outward in working it's an inward outworking which is why jesus said like you don't wash the outside of the cup and get the inside clean you have to clean the inside when you clean from the inside then the outside doesn't matter the outside comes into conformity with the inside but you can never clean the inside by cleaning the outside and so not in the oldness of the letter well that's the law what shall we say then is the law sin okay now again now we've gotten to a place where this is totally where he launches into mocking this. Okay? Deadpan reading. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Right? But what's really being said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Oh, God forbid. I mean, I hadn't known sin but by the law, but, you know, I mean, I didn't even know what lust was until the law said I shouldn't covet. But no, the law is not sin. He's, he's saying that this idea of wanting something I don't have wasn't even wrong to me until someone told me it was. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait, that's wrong? I had no idea until you told me, but and then you showed me where it's written down, says, thou shalt not covet. I didn't even know it was wrong until the law came. Is the law sin? Yes. That's the correct answer. This is all a mockery of this. The correct answer is, is the law sin? Yeah. <laughs> and so... He says in verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. How much more clear could it be that he's not being deadpan with his delivery here? 
I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Well, that's not good. Obviously, he's making a mockery of this thing. And so he says, continuing on, it says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Right, but the only thing that it's produced is this condemnation I didn't have before it was there. It's not holy. It's not just. It's not good. It's ridiculous. It, wh was that then which was good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment may become exceedingly sinful. He, it, how good is something that just becomes exceedingly sinful? It can't, good, you can't, get bad fruit from a good tree. We went through this before. You don't get good fruit from a bad tree. If the law is good, it can't produce sin. That doesn't make any sense. This is an attempt to completely discredit the law, and religion completely missed the point with its deadpan reading, and not seeing that this is going, how can anything good produce an abundance of sin? That makes no sense. It can't be holy. It can't be just. It does nothing but produce condemnation and death. And, you know, so then he goes on and he does the whole thing. For I know that in me that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Well, there it is. There's what the law tells you. The law says that there's nothing good in you. But he's not actually agreeing to that. He's not affirming to that. He's ridiculing this position with this with this whole satire that he's doing here, this whole sarcasm littered diatribe. Now then it's no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present within me, but how to perform that which I good I find not. For the good that I would do not, but the evil which I would do not, that I do. Now that I would do not, it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good Evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Because <sighs> that's what the law told me. Chapter 3, you suck as a human being. So... <laughs> Then he gets off of that and says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What's the law of sin? It's the law. It's anything that sets up performance as your basis for righteousness. It's anything that sets up achievement for your basis for value to others and to yourself. The law is sin. That's what he was saying. Even though the words in a deadpan reading say otherwise, he was mocking this position. He did it wonderfully. You got to read it for yourself with that mindset, and you'll just see how ridiculous the whole thing is. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's wonderfully written. This was written by someone that knew how to persuade people. This was not written by some moron that had a deadpan delivery to everything. This was written by someone that knew how to put down and ridicule things. Like when he said, you know, those who want to have righteousness by circumcision, why don't they just chop off the whole thing? This was not somebody, you know, false brethren. He, this was not somebody that, that stepped back and, and recoiled from the idea of using strong language or strong ridicule. So that's what's really going on is in chapter 7, is he's equating the law with arbitrarily inventing sin that didn't exist before, because he didn't know that lust was wrong until he saw a law that said, thou shalt not covet. And then he got into this whole thing of like, you know, well, I'm trying to do what's right, but apparently every time I try, there's another law that pops up and says, oh, can't do that. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't do that. And so, how frustrating is that? There's constantly some new rule, some new regulation, some new arbitrary uh, tradition of men that says, you know, got to do it this way, got to not do it that way, got to got to be here every single time that we hold a service, or else you're you're out. You know, there's there's no end 
to the inventing of new and arbitrary rules to make you the outsider and somebody else the insider, to make somebody special and to make somebody else not special, to make one person the elect and another person not the elect. So we're just going to explore this here in Acts 16. In verse 20, it says uh, that they brought the disciples, the apostles, to the magistrates saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Now this is true. They taught customs that were not lawful for them to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Well, why is that? Well, because they were saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar was Lord. So that was against Roman law for them to be doing that. And so we see even further that in Acts chapter 6, it says, uh, Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the, to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So this is, although it says set up false witnesses, the, the witnesses may have been false witnesses, but the accusation is, is accurate. They were speaking words against Moses. They were saying to change the custom that Moses delivered. They were speaking against the temple and the Mosaic system and the law. Now, this false witnesses would be like, let's say you, you were stealing from somebody, and in order to strengthen the case against you, someone went around and got a bunch of false witnesses to say they saw you doing it, for example. Okay, the accusation is true, you did steal, but the witnesses were false witnesses. That's what it's saying when it says set up false witnesses. It does not mean set up a false accusation. The accusation is accurate. They were speaking against the law. They were against the law of Moses. They, did, they were saying words that had to do with changing the customs which Moses d delivered. And so that was an accurate representation of what they were doing it's just that the attempt to have them condemned for it included rounding up people and saying you know here's what we want you to tell them is going on um, in order to get them into trouble because you know you have to have enough witnesses in order for that person to be accused and convicted and so forth there was at least somewhat of a justice system that said you, you can't just say something happened and, and we're going to take your word for it. You had to have additional witnesses that are going to stand up for your case. So they had false witnesses, but that accusation is accurate. They were against the law of Moses. And religion just really has not distanced itself and created a New Testament of conflict in which there is a grace message and there is a law message and they are at war with one another. In fact, those who promote the, the law message were the ones committing murder. They were the ones that were putting people to death. They were the ones going around and rounding up the early, uh, the early Christians, if you want to call them that, and murdering them were the people that were promoting the law. And so there was very much a war. There was very much a conflict. There was very much a reason to call those on the other side your enemy or to use terms like the devil and Satan and false brethren. Why? Because if somebody has infiltrated your community and their goal is to get you killed, you might want to call them false brethren. You know? You might want to say, you know what? This guy is not really here to to listen to what we have to say. He's here to spy on us and to get us killed. Well, then that might be a false brother. You know, don't go calling people false brethren because they don't agree with your doctrine perfectly. You know, the, they're talking about people that were actual spies for the other side in a bloody war that resulted in people being murdered and executed. So that's the context to understand a false brethren. It's not some accusation to hurl at people because, you know, they don't agree with your 
idea of end times. It's just stupid. Um, unless they're trying to kill you and they're trying to, you know, document what you're saying and, and they're, they're planning to kill you, they're not false brethren, okay? They just disagree with you. And you're just an intolerant asshole who can't deal with it. So you hurl an accusation of false brethren. That's not what the... the what was going on was a war. And religion has completely whitewashed that war. It, and it's just ridiculous. So we want to look at how in Romans 8 and verse 33... Who is the one that is doing the accusing? Who is the one that's doing the condemning? Who is the one that is pointing the finger of accusation? And so in verse 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So what this is saying is that God justifies. Christ makes intercession. Who's condemning? Well, it's not God or Christ. God is not the devil. Accuser means devil. God is not the devil. So what do we see? We see in John 5.45, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. So who's the accuser? Moses. That means the law. The accuser is the law. It is the law that condemns, not God. It is the law that accuses, not God.